Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding through the glen. <laughs> One of only five Grade 1 listed buildings in the city of Nottingham, the Church of St Mary the Virgin is also the oldest religious foundation and the largest medieval building in the city. Situated in the heart of the historic lace market, it is also known as St Mary's in the Lace Market. I'm getting peckish, Fran. <laughs> Want me breakfast? I am making the milk. <laughs> <laughs> We've um, started making our own oat milk, mainly because um, sometimes when we're stuck in the middle of nowhere, we haven't got milk. Um, and it's quite heavy to carry back and really expensive to buy oat milk or almond milk. And it is the simplest thing to make. So I make it every day now. We've just worked these measurements out suit us, but I'm giving you proportional volume so you can make as much as you want. We have one cup or one portion of oats, half a portion of nuts. I'm using um, cashew. cashew nuts, but you can use almonds as well. This just makes it a little bit creamier. So that's one oats, half of nuts and five measures of water. And the water is best if it's quite cold. Um, some people keep it in the fridge overnight, but we don't worry. My one electrical gadget, um, and this can get a bit messy if I'm not careful, and you blend it for 30 seconds. That's very noisy, friend. <laughs> Um, I guess if you've got a high speed mixer, it'll be quicker, but um, we manage. OK, the next step is to strain this um, and the proper recipes. The real recipes tell you to buy a nut bag. Um, I had some muslin, so I've stitched together some muslin and it works really, really well. Um, and you just strain this and then the fun bit is squeezing it out. It's just like you're milking a cow. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as a little side point, when I was about 16, I won the competition at a country fair for milking the cow. It was a plastic cow, but I won, won a prize for milking the cow, so there you are. What country fair was in the East End of London when you were 16? It was on Wanstead Flats, <laughs> next to the uh, sewage outfall, but yeah. <laughs> So normally I'd leave that to strain through a little while before I do this. Well, um, you can do that because we can stop the video and come back when okay. it's strained through a Otherwise little bit. Otherwise it's going to get really messy. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, we've got this milky liquid coming out of it. And I just twist the bag and then you'll get down to the bottom. You can start squeezing the milk out. And there's two bonuses to this. Oats are really, really good for your skin. So this is um, the oat milk liquid that's coming out of here makes your hand really soft when you're doing this. And at the end of it, we'll get a bag of dried or squeezed out oatmeal um, and nothing gets wasted. The oatmeal I put into my bread recipe to make, well, any bread really, it just, uh, the oats just go into the bread. So you're getting an oatmeal bread. 
that's done so this is the bit now these will go straight into the bread so nothing gets wasted if we have any vegan cream we put a little bit of cream in here just to make it creamier but i'm going to pour a little bit of this out to show you what it's like that's perfect oat milk and if you've never tried it and if you're not if you're vegetarian it doesn't matter once you get used to having this on cereals, it's brilliant. And it's probably cost me five pence, ten pence to make that. We're making it every day and we haven't got to carry big bags of milk or bottles of milk back to the boat. So it's win-win. Besides that, there's no plastic in the production. We don't have to buy plastic cartons. <laughs> no, it's so cheap. The and... oats have come in a paper bag. We buy organic oats in a paper bag. We can buy the nuts loose at a refill shop when we buy them. And have I've got a great big bag of them at the moment. So no plastic, no environmental issues. It's just win-win. And then I'm making, the weather's really hot at the moment. So we're not baking bread conventionally. It's too hot. To have the oven on. I think we're due for 20, 34 degrees next week, aren't mm. we? So we're making bread in the Mr. D's cooker, and it's the same bread recipe that is on the website for my no need bread, except for this, you do need to have a little bit more flour and knead it first. And then if you've got a Mr. D's cooker, the recipe is on their website for bread. And when this comes out, the first time we made it. We just thought this looks awful. It looks like a pudding. This has been overnight. Um, and all it's taken is about 10 minutes boiling before it went into the cooker. So here is the bread, which looks like a pudding. <laughs> and the first time we did it, we thought we can't eat that. But watch this. That. It's so it's soft and light, isn't it? It's amazing bread. Lovely, lovely bread. And it's especially it's good toasted, isn't it? Really good toasted. And we make, we eat too much bread, actually. We will probably eat that in a day, but we're still having less bread than we would be buying if we were buying it. And once again, plastic free, it's taken 10 minutes on the stove to cook and the rest of the cooking is done in here. And in the hot weather, that's just a bonus, isn't it? And how much does that cost, a loaf like that? I don't know. 30 20, pence, 30 pence, 20, 30 yeah. pence. Yeah, it's amazing. So, um, so let's have breakfast. Yeah, come on then. Perfect. That's as good as any supermarket oat milk we've ever made, isn't it? I think it is. It's Yeah, yeah it is. And as I say, you can make it creamier if you want to by adding a little bit of proper cream. Yeah. But... um. Don't be put off if you're not a vegetarian. Just have a go. Lovely. Right, let's get stuck in. Ooh. Well, you know me, viewers. I love a woman and home magazine. And, uh, but look, who's on page 44? Herself. Woman of inspiration, aren't you? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> On your news agent stall now.
Norris Football Club, newly promoted to the Premiership. Here we are, just left Nottingham, back on the River Trent, heading to Radcliffe on Trent, which is only a couple of miles away or so to moor up. And we're cruising with our friends from YouTube channel One Day More. A board. A board. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> it's them in with the turquoise boat. How grand. been here for a couple of days now and um, boy was it noisy when we turned up oh, Francis. <laughs> it's got to have been the noisiest mooring that we've ever had because it's the world championships at the freestyle canoeing competitions and um, oh boy it was noisy until about one o'clock in the morning when they had their celebrations for all the medalists. <laughs> yeah they had this van with booming speakers playing booming music. <laughs> boom boom boom. <laughs> Anyway, it was good fun watching the canoeists for a while. It's amazing, uh, just just incredible what they can do on little kayaks these days. And great to see that they've made use of the river. Um, well, it isn't the weir that goes down there. The weir goes down the other side, yeah, doesn't they've, it? They've but created they've just... a slalom course. Fab. Uh, just amazing. So we took a walk Fab. yesterday all the way around the um, Rowan Lake, which is about a three-mile circuit all the way around. Uh, we had a good uh, couple of days, great weekend. And it's great because we said yesterday that things like this we wouldn't see or do if we weren't on the boat. We no. would never have chosen to go and watch canoeing and rowing championships. Um, but it was really, really enjoyable. We're not having a go though. So we're going to go through home lock in a minute. It's a big lock. You could fit about nine boats in there if you wished. And behind us is uh, the sluices for the flood control. Uh, there are five five metre wide uh, sluices there that are automatically triggered when the river gets to a certain point so to prevent flooding further downstream. So uh, we've got about five miles to do today, nothing arduous yeah. and a couple of locks. So let's get going. And this lock, it's very exciting today. Let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. This lock is really exciting. Rich is particularly excited because there's no lock keeper no, on, lock duty. Not on duty. So he can do it himself, which you're allowed to do if there's no lock keeper. So it's the, all um, down to you. The lights on orange, amber, which means you can proceed with caution, but you have to operate it yourself because there's no lock keeper on. So yeah, come on, I can push some buttons. <laughs> come on then. Well, the girls decided that if anybody's going to be pushing buttons, it's going to be them, and left us chaps to drive the boats through this rather deep lock. So this is the lock keeper on duty today, and it's Caroline from One Day More Aboard. This is her first electric lock, and she's dead chuffed because she says it's so much easier than doing everything manually. And we've got a guest boat with us as well at the back.
we arrived at Gunthorpe Lock, pulled in to fill up with water and was able to turn the boat around on the wide river to moor up on the pontoons next to Pete and Caroline. For a bit of a walk. We're at Gunthorpe on the, the River Trent, not far from Newark on Trent, so we thought we'd come and do a bit of a circuit, uh, get the legs stretched and have a look what's around us. And it's quite a historic area isn't it this, going yeah. back Roman times and uh, there's lots that we're hoping to explore and see. Like this old, what remains of a, a toll bridge demolished in 1927. Oh, we wouldn't have known this was here. There's no uh, mention of it on the maps or anything. It's just as we're walking along this little side road, we saw a bin and a seat, a bench and a track. And um, yeah, we've discovered something new. <laughs> That's beautiful. Oh, wow. Just spotted an old windmill, which has obviously been turned into a home. Here are the graves of three airmen who were amongst seven that died when their bomber plane crashed locally on the 27th of July 1940. Now, just behind there is the old rectory to the church. They had it tough, those vicars in the Victorian <laughs> times, didn't they? It Frank? goes back, 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 about three gardens it's got, yeah. Absolutely stunning, though. <laughs> so what's that then? I'm not happy. What's up with you? <laughs> this is a linden tree. Many people know it as a lime tree. And I've been looking for them for ages. The flowers are supposed to make really lovely tea. You can smell them everywhere. And the flowers are supposed to make really lovely tea, which is good for you, good for your mental health and everything. I've been looking for so long for them, but the flowers are always 20 foot in the air. Eventually I found them and they're just too old, they're gone. So next year, maybe. <laughs> Isn't there a song about the linden tree? I don't know. Is it Schubert? I don't know, I've never heard of it. Answers on a postcard. <laughs> Oh, 
beautiful view. Stopped for lunch, which consisted of an apple and a banana. Friends sat on a bench dedicated to Ken Smith. <laughs> and this beautiful little oak tree here, somebody's planted, donated in loving memory of Hilary Steamson. Well, Hilary, you've got a lovely little tree in your memory. How you doing, Fran? <laughs> it's all right, yeah. Your dog's not much help. He's just pulled me up here. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Oh, well done. Done with style and panache, Fran. Do you reckon? <laughs> Come on then. The field ahead of us there is the site of a Roman town called Margidunum. Margidunum? Margidunum. Mar Easy for you to say. <laughs> Anyway, it runs alongside the Foss Way, which is a road the Romans built shortly after they occupied Britain in AD 43, and runs all the way from Exeter, 182 miles, to Lincoln. And all the way, dotted all the way along it, are settlements and forts, etc. And there's still bits of the road that you can see, which we'll show when we go to, we'll show you when we go to Lincoln. Apparently there's a Roman arch that is still used as a road. So looking forward to seeing that. But uh, yeah, really interesting. Uh, but there's not a lot there to see now because um, it's, it's all just gone. a field. <laughs> it's it's, all there, there is an area that has not been cultivated though, which we're assuming is where the main part of the town was. And the excavations have shown ditches that would originally have just been covered with leather tents. Then it was a wooden village. And then apparently in AD 60, Boudicca, had a wicked way and flattened some of it and it got replaced with um, stone buildings. Or but Bo there's nothing to see, is there? Or Bodicea if you're over the age of 30. Bodicea, Boudica. But Foss Way, Foss <laughs> comes from the Latin fossa, meaning ditch. And uh, it just marks the most western part of the uh, Roman Empire in Britain. So yeah, really interesting. And we've walked all this way to see a field. <laughs> yep, now we've got to get our Roman walking boots on and march all the way back. Oh well, <laughs> sell RV. Did the Romans say sell RV? No. What did they say? Um, carpe diem? What carpe does that mean? Carpe diem, yeah. <laughs> Seize the beaten day. <laughs> Bit of land in a house like that, Fran, that'll do, wouldn't it? Right, I tell you, that is perfectly big enough to live in. It is. Right, downstairs, combined kitchen, living area, bedroom upstairs, art studio, weaving studio, veg garden. Hey, and a mile talking. from the from the river, with moorings. Cheers, Fran. Cheers. <sighs> Lovely walk. And that's the best way to end it.